So much has happened around the Ivy League since mid-March, and the next Ivy League reporter, Jen Hatfield, is here to chat all about it, from the WNBA draft to the transfer portal and Cornell's new head coach. Locked on women's basketball starts now. You are Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and happy Friday. You are Locked On to Women's Basketball. I'm Natalie Heverin and I'm a features writer and the Atlantic 10 beat reporter for the next. Thanks for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen every day. And remember, Locked On Women's Basketball is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Game off. We got to talk more about Monopoly Go. This fast-paced game lets you team up with friends for tournaments to unlock awesome prizes like unique stickers for trading, cool playing pieces, and hilarious emojis for taunting your friends. So download Monopoly Go, now free on Google Play or the App Store. Game on. If this is your first time listening to Locked On Women's Basketball, we at The Next have over 100 reported pieces every single month, including 198 in March and more than 100 in April. We have a beat reporter on every single WNBA team, one on more than 15 NCAA beats, so get that YouTube subscription up. And you can also support us by subscribing to The Next, $9 a month, $72 a year at thenexttubes.com. Today we'll be talking about all three uh, Ivy League tr- Ivy League graduates who were drafted in the WNBA draft last month, the Ivy League players in the transfer portal, and those who have committed to new schools, as well as Cornell's new head coach, Emily Garner. Joining me today is the next Ivy League and Washington Mystics beat writer and managing editor, Jen Hatfield. Starting off a few weeks ago, who was drafted and by what team in the WNBA draft? Yeah, Natalie, thanks for having me back. Glad to be here uh, two weeks in a row um, and to talk about the Ivy League to boot. So, uh, you know, the Ivy League, the Ivy League's night in the 2024 WNBA draft was historic. Uh, I think that word can sometimes be overused, um, the word historic. But in the case of the Ivy League in this WNBA draft, it was absolutely true. Um, They had three players drafted all in the third round, uh, starting with Harvard graduate Mackenzie Forbes, who spent her graduate year at USC. She went 28th overall to the Los Angeles Sparks, the the California native, getting a little homecoming, getting to stay home there. Then at number 34 overall, uh, Columbia senior Abby Shu was drafted uh, by the Connecticut Sun. And then right after her, one pick after her, her former Columbia teammate, Caitlin Davis, who teamed up with Forbes this year at USC, uh, went 35th overall to the New York Liberty. So um, really an exciting draft around the Ivy League. And what were the celebrations like? I know we talked about it offline a lot um, as they were happening, but can you just recap for the folks uh, what those magical moments were like for the draftees? Yeah, so, you know, your third round picks are are sitting through two rounds of the draft. The first round usually takes about an hour, an hour and change. So they're sitting there, you know, just waiting, biding their time. Uh, you know, getting nervous in that second round, wondering if they might go there. And then finally, their their name gets called. So that's kind of what's what's going through their head. Uh, Forbes had a watch party at USC head coach Lindsay Gottlieb's house um, with her family, teammates, friends, that sort of thing. Um, so so that place went nuts when she got selected. Um, they really celebrated. Um, there were some great photos out of that event that USC shared. Shout out to them for that. Um, So just a really great moment, uh, especially because she was able to stay in Los Angeles. Um, Abby Shu did her watch party at Columbia with her teammates and her family and her coaches. Um, It looked like the same room where they watched their NCAA tournament selection. uh, And, you know, they they similarly went nuts. Um, And then, you know, it's it's kind of a unique thing where the third round, the picks come so quickly. So literally as as Abby and everyone uh, in that draft party, we're still reacting to Abby being drafted. Um, Abby's the first one to notice. Caitlin Davis drafted right behind her. And so it kind of just, it amps up the celebrations again. And, and Forbes kind of had a similar situation where they had kind of just come down from her selection and were kind of breathing normally again. And then Davis gets drafted and the whole thing starts again. So um, Davis is, is less of a watch party type of person and decided to watch it privately with a couple uh, people at, at her place. So uh, that was a little bit different, but I'm sure no no less excited for, for how that all transpired. 
And taking a step back, can you take me and our listeners through the history of Ivy League graduates in the WNBA? Yeah, so the reason I called this a historic draft, um, heading into 2024, only five players had ever been drafted into the WNBA. Um, a few others have uh, played in WNBA games as uh, undrafted players, um, but only five players in 27 drafts had been picked. And then this year we got three. Um, and, you know, in previous drafts, no, no, uh, no draft before this one had ever had even two Ivy League players. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's just monumental to go from five to eight draftees all time. Um, that club, in addition to the ones who've been drafted uh, this year, you know, Allison Feaster, uh, the architect of, of number 16 seed Harvard's upset over number one seed Stanford in the NCAA tournament. She was the first one to do it back in 1998. Um, but more recently, it's included Belle Allery from Princeton in 2020 getting drafted um, in the first round. And then uh, Princeton's Abby Myers, um, who played her graduate year at Maryland, also getting drafted in the first round uh, just last year. And are all three of them in WNBA training camps uh, competing to make a roster right now? No. So Mackenzie Forbes is in L.A. Sparks camp and is is fighting for a roster spot. But both Abby Shu and Caitlin Davis are are what's known as draft and stash. So neither of those players are getting brought into their respective teams' training camps, but those teams will retain their rights and they'll be able to um, potentially be invited to come to camp next year when uh, the decision makers there uh, think they they have a better chance of making the roster. So um, in the meantime, they can work on their games and, and develop as players. It just won't be in the WNBA. And does Forbes have a chance to make the Sparks roster? Yeah, I mean, it's a deep and competitive Sparks camp, but, uh, you know, she's she's beaten a lot of long odds in her career, including getting into Harvard as a transfer, which is uh, darn close to about as likely as winning the lottery. Um, it's it's really hard to get in. Um, so, you know, and, and she also has had as her assistant coach at USC, um, a former assistant coach for Kurt, Los Angeles Sparks head coach, Kurt Miller. So she's kind of had like an insider's um, training, so to speak, like, uh, she's been kind of given some tricks, uh, tips and tricks on like what Kurt likes and what his pet peeves are and what she should make sure to do and not do. Um, so, so you could say she's had a little bit of a leg up, uh, in that respect, but I mean, the Sparks knew what they were getting when they drafted her. They were at pretty much all of her games cause they're a local team. Um, they saw her play a ton this year. They even saw her play when uh, she was at Harvard, um, at least Reagan Peebly did, their general manager, who wasn't with the Sparks at the time, but but she saw Forbes play in college. Um, they were very surprised she was still available in the third round. Um, some mock drafts had her, I think, as high as 13th overall, so um, she slipped a little bit, but um, to a spot that, that, is, that is great for her, great for the Sparks. Um, she also even, uh, her, her trainer when she was a little kid is actually an assistant coach for the Sparks. So she's got all these connections to L.A., um, and there are a lot of guards in that in that training camp. But, uh, it, you know, she's she's competitive. She always believes in herself. She's going to attack that. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if she surprises some folks and sticks around longer than than people expect. And are any other Ivy League players expected to play overseas? Yeah, so Davis is uh, already in Mexico, from what I understand, playing a three month uh, overseas season, um, you know, it, my understanding is she didn't really want to play a full, you know, European season like a lot of WNBA players do, because that would basically be like a whole nother college season just at the pro level. Um, so she's going to play that kind of shortened season in Mexico, um, hopes to really work on her shot and, and be aggressive with that. Um, and then she'll train with the New York Liberty starting next January. So like middle of the off season. So she gets time to work with them and kind of get in their system and maybe get some of those insider tricks that I was talking about with Forbes um, before she goes on to their, their training camp. Um, you know, and then, and then another Ivy leaguer who we haven't talked about yet uh, to keep an eye on is, is Camille Zimmerman. So Zimmerman uh, was Columbia's all time leading scorer before Abby Shu broke her record this year, uh, went undrafted, but, uh, has participated in WNBA training camp before, um, has played overseas a bunch, um, and has done really well in three on three in particular, um, has played for team USA and that, and, you know, was in the group that, that was just in Massachusetts last week, you know, trying out for a bunch of USA opportunities, um, including possible selection to the Olympics. So, um, she's definitely one to watch along with, uh, Princeton's Blake Dietrich, who, 
uh, was also undrafted, um, has played a bunch in the WNBA, uh, just kind of hanging around, making teams. She's on the Sparks roster on a camp contract, but was also um, in the three-on-three -three, uh, training camp and has teamed up with Zimmerman uh, lots of times in three-on-three. -three. So those are some names to watch. Awesome. Well, coming up next, we'll finish talking about Ivy League draftees, um, as well as talk about where Ivy League graduate transfers are heading. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. All right, game off. We got to pause here to talk more about Monopoly Go. I know what you're saying, flag on the play. You already talked about that, but there is just so much good stuff in this game. In Monopoly Go, you can team up with friends for time tournaments where you work together to build up each other's boards. The more you win together, the more awesome prizes you unlock, and there's so much to get. Unique stickers you can trade with friends to complete albums for big prizes, cool new playing pieces to travel the boards with, hilarious emojis for taunting friends when you smash their buildings or heist their vaults. Plus, Monopoly Go feels new and exciting every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges. A ton include their own unique mini games like Digging for Treasure or a robot pachinko machine. And there's always new timed events that help you win big, like massive multipliers for everything you win or rent frenzies. There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go. So get off the bench and go download it now free on Google Play or the App Store. Game on. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today. A free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news. Streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. So, you know, finishing up our discussion on um, Ivy League players in the draft, you know, what does this draft class show about the Ivy League? And do you think it may help other Ivy League graduates get drafted down the line, kind of opening people's eyes to the talent in the Ivy League? I do. I hope so. Anyway, the Ivy League has kind of been like a sleeping giant lately. They've quietly been one of the best mid-major conferences um, in the entire NCAA um, over the past several years. And uh, you're kind of seeing it with the with the grad transfers that we're about to discuss. You know, lots of Ivy League graduates going on to to not only play but really be difference makers at Power Five schools. And uh, seeing some of them get drafted either straight from their Ivy League schools, like Abby Shu, or after playing that graduate year, uh, like Davis and Forbes, um, is just kind of an extension of that, of building upon that. You know, um, as they as as players like that make their impact. Um, both in the Ivy League and outside of it, it's, it's only natural that WNBA decision makers are are noticing and, and recognizing that talent. So um, I think it's great for the league. I think it's great exposure for the league, too. It's, you know, when when Harvard head coach Carrie Moore was hired a couple of years ago, she talked about um, wanting to make sure that Harvard was a place that players that recruits like really top recruits knew that they could go. Um, not only for arguably the best education in the world, but also to have a real shot at being drafted into the WNBA. Players wouldn't have to choose between an Ivy League education and playing pro. Um, and she actually had a tweet that has aged super well um, about that when she was watching the 2022 draft and saying she she wanted more more draft picks coming out of Harvard. So uh, she got it. Um, and I think it's it's really sending a message about, you know, a lot of players go to the Ivy League because they want to set themselves up for life after basketball. Um, but this is also showing that the Ivy League can set you up for life in basketball and outside of basketball. Yeah, that's really exciting. And before we get too far into the transfers this season, can you just give our listeners a quick refresher on how the Ivy League rules impact players with eligibility left after they graduate with their four year degree? Yeah, so the Ivy League is different from other conferences in this respect. They do not allow graduate students to play. Um, so once you've graduated, even if you uh, would normally have eligibility left, like let's say you got hurt and you missed your freshman year. Um, at, in other conferences, you take that as a red shirt and you're, you're totally fine. You end up playing, uh, you know, playing four years on the court, um, five years, staying five years at the school. But in the Ivy League, you get hurt, you miss your freshman year, you're, you're still going through. And once you graduate as a senior, 
you, you're done. You, you can't play um, anymore in the Ivy League. You can't play as a grad. Um, but you still have that one year that you get to get back um, and you just have to take it somewhere else outside the conference. And so if I have my numbers correctly, there have been 15 players from the Ivy League that have entered the portal as grad transfers with six committed so far. Let's start off talking about um, a story that you wrote um, in the last few weeks. Um, can you just talk about where Kyla Jones ended up and why it's a great fit for her? Yeah, so brown guard Kyla Jones um, is kind of a great story of a player who was lightly recruited out of high school, ended up at, at Brown, uh, slowly kind of rose through the Ivy League, uh, finally got her all Ivy honors this year, much deserved, um, and is now, so So this group of Ivy League grad transfers has the extra year, not because 15 of them had season-ending injuries, um, but because it's the last group of, of COVID year players. So these players, their freshman year was the season that the Ivy League canceled um, the season because of COVID. Um, so they just missed that entire season, but they were still enrolled in school and now they have an extra year to use. So just to be clear on that. Um, so Kyla Jones is going to head home to Chicago um, and she's going to go play at Northwestern, um, which is just, I mean, I can't think of a like more clear fit between person and player in a, I mean, between player and program in a, in a long time. Um, she's a local kid, um, the high academic piece is there. Um, and she's just like a perfect fit. If you kind of look at the statistical like weaknesses of Northwestern's team last year, she kind of plugs right in um, as a shifty guard who can who can get to the rim, score in the mid range and, and plays really good defense. All those things are things that Northwestern really, really needed. And they got them. And then Caitlin Chen committed to UConn this week and she'll be coached by her Princeton head coaches, head coach from Carla Barubi's days at UConn. Um, what do you think about the fit and what are you most excited to see from her for next year? Yeah, I mean, I know you know a ton about UConn too, so so you can totally weigh in on this fit. But uh, for me, you know, I think, I think Caitlin Chen as Princeton's point guard for the past several years, I think she slides right into where Nika Mule left off um, and, and can help, you know, run this offense. Um, you know, she's, she is also great at getting to the rim, scoring in the mid range. She's got this like kind of ridiculous array of layups that she can deploy. So I think UConn fans will enjoy seeing her inventive finishes, but she's also a very good three point shooter, three level scorer, just, um, you know, and, and of course, if you play for Carla Baruby, you can play some defense. Um, so that should transfer too. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see like the two or three player game with, with Caitlin and Paige Beckers and AZ Fudd, like just, just seeing that like dynamic, uh, like interchange between them and seeing how they can uh, really just go get buckets. I think it's going to be tremendously entertaining. Um, and, you know, I'm just excited to also just see how she fits, you know, Caitlin's um, like a very joyful player, like kind of goofy. And I'm like curious to see how that fits with like Gino's kind of, uh, stern exterior, um, you know, does she, does she kind of like have that like banter with him that, you know, some other UConn players like a Paige Beckers or even a Nika Mule have with him? Like, you know, how does she, I'm, I'm sure her, her new UConn teammates will, will love her and, and, you know, get to know her quickly and all that. So, so just excited to see how she fits in on that level too. And, and, you know, if we get any fun social content out of that. Also yeah, excited I to see what her, uh, if she, if she does start what her, starting lineup intro is because she's had some pretty darn good ones over the past few years, including a Lion King uh, reenactment, um, uh, not this past season, but the season before. Oh, yeah. Excited for all of that. Um, and, you know, so far we've talked about two transfers, but are there any other transfers to power conference schools? And can you talk about them, their new home and how they fit in at their new school? Yeah, so uh, Caitlin Chen's Princeton teammate, Chet Nowacki, uh, is headed to Georgetown, which is a homecoming for her as well. She's from the, the D.C. area, um, and so she and Caitlin will get to match up in the Big East, which is pretty fun, um, and she'll also get to be coached by Bella Allery, who's a grad assistant over there. Um, so we just love to see that fit. Um, yeah, again, just a very natural kind of fit between player and program. Uh, Nowaki's um, uh, kind of a fun story too. She didn't play a lot, a whole lot her first couple of years at Princeton, 
Um, you know, but uh, Carla Berube said she had a really good foreign tour and seemed to have improved a lot. And we didn't really see it early on because she wasn't playing a whole lot either her senior year. Um, but then she slid into the starting lineup in January um, in the middle of Ivy play. And man, she just she just took off. Um, she was a, a she's so she's six feet tall, can play in the post or on the perimeter. Um, she was typically playing in the post uh, for Princeton this year. And it's just a ferocious rebounder as if they needed another one, right? With uh, the player Howard Magdal calls a human rebound in Ellie Mitchell. This was like an abundance of rebounding riches, but um, she's a great rebounder, can, can you know, finish through contact in the post, um, plays great defense, is a good leader. So um, great to see her find a spot there. Um, and then are there any other players that you're excited to see where they land? Yeah, I think the the one that we're you know keeping an eye on right now as a possible uh, likely power six transfer is is pen forward Jordan Obi. Um, you know she's kind of a really do it all big. I like to compare her to Maisha Hines Allen of the Washington Mystics. If any of our listeners um, have have watched the Mystics and and can kind of envision that, um, you know Obi can shoot the three. She can post up, play inside. She's she's really versatile. She can be moved around. So. Um, and she's a first team all Ivy, uh, first team all Big Five, which is um, you know the the five Philadelphia area schools um, that includes you know Villanova. Um, so um, you know she's just a really good player, and I think she will have no shortage of, of options on the Power Six level, and it'll be exciting to see where she ends up. Awesome. Well, coming up next, we'll wrap up our Ivy League spectacular uh, by talking about Cornell's new head coach Emily Garner. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at eBay Motors Dot com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. So as you wrote about recently, um, Cornell has a new head coach for the first time in a long time. Uh, Emily Garner, who coached just down the road for me at Trinity College for eight years. What were some of her accomplishments there? Yeah, so so Emily Garner took a Trinity program that hadn't really distinguished her, it distinguished itself all that much in the NESCAC, its conference, um, before she arrived, and and really just kind of slowly and steadily built them into um, a championship team. So um, you know they she has the highest winning percentage in school history at almost seventy percent. Um, they went to the NCAA tournament, just like a really solid uh, building job. Um, recruiting job, coaching job. So um, yeah, sets her up sets her up well for the transition into the Ivy League. The NESCAC um, is a really high academic conference in Division Three. So that's where your Tufts, your Bowdoin, your Amherst, um, those types of schools uh, play. So it's it's a really great Division Three conference uh, academically and athletically. And you spoke to her, wrote a fabulous story about her. Our listeners should go check it out once they finish listening. Um, but how is she approaching her new position at Cornell? Yeah, you know, she's really excited. She's got great energy and, and she knows that, that this is going to be a building process for Cornell. Cornell has struggled since winning its lone Ivy title in 2008 um, and really struggled last last season in particular. And so uh, and that uh, and the Ivy League has only gotten tougher uh, since 2008, much tougher since 2008. So um, this is not going to be an overnight thing, especially given the limited transfers in that Ivy programs take. Um, so she's just trying to, you know, build every day as much of we hear that all the time, right? Like take every day, one day as it comes. But um, that's really kind of how she has to approach this. She's she's looking at Cornell and 
you know, thinking about what differentiates it from other Ivy League schools and what she can use as selling points to bring recruits in. So, for example, um, recruits who are looking for like a big college type of environment, uh, Cornell's the largest school in the Ivy League um, in terms of undergraduate enrollment. So players who are looking for that who are maybe uh, not interested in the city life um, that like a Columbia or a Harvard uh, or a pen might offer them might be more at home up in Ithaca in upstate New York. So um, that sort of thing. Um, she's really kind of leaning into the to the you know green space that she thinks that uh, Cornell can provide and and looking to really set down roots, build a culture, build a program, and and you know get something going in Ithaca. And and I don't think she's intimidated by the challenge of the Ivy League, even as she knows um, she knows really well how good it is because she. Had to coach against Carla Verubi when Carla was at was was at Tufts, and now Carla's at Princeton, and and just continues to to win almost nonstop. And you know, what stood out to you most during your interview with her? Yeah, you know, I think it was just her her energy, really. Um, you know, she's she's kind of a, a fresh face in the Ivy League. Um, Dana Smith had been at Cornell for over two decades, and so it's just an infusion of fresh energy. Um, I think she's going to be great for the league. Um, it was also interesting talking with her about coming from Division Three to Division One because that's um, a little bit of a pathway that's picking up more steam lately. As I mentioned, Carla Berube's done it, um, so we talked a little bit about that pathway. Um, we talked about how she would measure success and, um, you know, I, I am just excited to, to get to know her more and see what she's able to do to put her stamp on this program. I think she has some players who, um, you know, could be really good with, with some, you know, player development and coaching and systems that work for them. And, um, I think she'll have an opportunity to really, you know, put her stamp on this, like I said, and, and, and build something and we'll just have to see, you know, you know, you always want to say that like every coach sounds like they have a great plan for success, but the reality is only four teams can finish in the top half of the eight team Ivy League. So, um, you know, we'll see like who elbows who out and, and who ends up at the bottom. Uh, uh, and like I said, it's only getting more competitive. Yeah. And this is something we've talked about offline, um, but, but it feels like there's been a lot of turnover of Ivy League head coaches recently. Um, is that true? And what do you think it means for the league big picture? Yeah, there has definitely been more turnover among the Ivy League head coaches lately. Um, you know, half of the Ivy League head coaches have now been hired in the past two years, which is, um, you know, I, I think it's probably safe to say that that, that is unprecedented, at least since, uh, you know, the sport got more you know, coaching positions got more professionalized, you know, maybe there was this level of turnover in, you know, the 70s and early 80s as, as uh, programs kind of built up their women's basketball programs. But in, in recent history, it's, it's unprecedented. And, you know, I, th I think it shows, uh, number one, like, well, number one, I think it just offers um, like really nice, like fresh energy, fresh schemes, fresh coaching philosophies um, to the Ivy League, which is only good for a conference that, you know, you hear a lot about the tradition of the Ivy League and athletics or not. Like it has this big tradition and it's very, um, its history is very important to, to it. And sometimes it's good to just like in, inject some fresh perspectives and fresh mindsets and, and new ideas. Um, so I think that's, that's a nice thing. Um, the other thing is, you know, and former Princeton head coach, Courtney Banghart, who's at North Carolina has talked about this, how, uh, you know, it used to be, kind of tricky if you wanted to leave the Ivy League because there was some skepticism about how you would do in a conference that offers scholarships. And she she always thought that that was ridiculous because she's like, if I could recruit in a league without scholarships, imagine how I can recruit when I can offer scholarships. Um, but, you know, there was kind of a perception, uh, you know, like, like, how good is this league? And, and can coaches, you know, adapt to go in another league? And I think that again, as the Ivy League has has grown and strengthened, as we've talked about a lot on this podcast, you know that that myth has been firmly dispelled, and um, I think there are a lot of things to like if you're a head coach in, in, about the Ivy League, including kind of your relative roster stability from year to year. So um, I think the turnover, you know, there there are coaches that I've been I've been very sad to see go, but I think it, you know, it bodes well for the Ivy League that these are you know increasingly high demand positions and that 
Ivy League coaches are are having their names thrown around for major college jobs and sometimes go uh, take them and and sometimes do really well in them. Like I think that's that's great for the league to kind of be um, like less walled off uh, from power conferences and other leagues in terms of coaching interchange and and hiring. Thank you again for joining me today, Jen. Um, where can the listeners find you online? Yeah, so obviously head to thenexthoops.com and you'll find all of our work, including my stuff. Um, you can find me on Twitter or X um, at Jen Hatfield one That's Jen with two N's. And then we've got our The Next Hoops Instagram handle right here, or it's just at The Next Hoops um, on Instagram. And thanks to our listeners for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen every day. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. And make sure to tune in tomorrow to hear from our WNBA draft crew.